Chapter Nine of A Girl of the Limberlost by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine, wherein Elnora discovers a violin and Billy disciplines Margaret. Elnora missed the little figure at the bridge the next morning. She slowly walked up the street and turned in at the wide entrance to the school grounds. She scarcely could comprehend that only a week ago she had gone there friendless, alone, and so sick at heart that she was physically ill. Today she had decent clothing, books, friends, and her mind was at ease to work on her studies. As she approached home that night, the girl paused in amazement. Her mother had company, and she was laughing. Elnora entered the kitchen softly and peeped into the sitting room. Mrs. Comstock sat in her chair, holding a book, and every few seconds a soft chuckle broke into a real laugh. Mark Twain was doing his work, while Mrs. Comstock was not lacking in a sense of humor. Elnora entered the room before her mother saw her. Mrs. Comstock looked up with flushed face. "'Where did you get this?' she demanded. "'I bought it,' said Elnora. "'Bought it? With all the taxes due?' "'I paid for it out of my Indian money, mother,' said Elnora. "'I couldn't bear to spend so much on myself and nothing at all on you. "'I was afraid to buy the dress I should have liked to, "'and I thought the book would be company while I was gone. "'I haven't read it, but I do hope it's good.' "'Good? It's the biggest piece of foolishness I have read in all my life. "'I've laughed all day ever since I found it. "'I had a notion to go out and read some of it to the cows "'and see if they wouldn't laugh.' "'If it made you laugh, it's a wise book,' said Elnora. "'Wise?' cried Mrs. Comstock. "'You can stake your life it's a wise book. "'It takes the smartest man there is to do this kind of fooling.' "'And she began laughing again. "'Elnora, highly satisfied with her purchase, "'went to her room and put on her working clothes. "'Thereafter she made a point of getting a book "'that she thought would interest her mother "'from the library every week "'and leaving it on the sitting-room table.' Every night she carried home at least two school books and studied until she had mastered the points of each lesson. She did her share of the work faithfully, and every available minute she was in the field searching for cocoons, for the moths promised to become her best source of income. She gathered large baskets of nests, flowers, mosses, insects, and all sorts of natural history specimens, and sold them to the grade teachers. At first she tried to tell these instructors what to teach their pupils about the specimens, but recognizing how much more she knew than they, one after another begged her to study at home and use her spare hours in school to exhibit and explain nature subjects to their pupils. Elnora loved the work, and she needed the money, for every few days some matter of expense arose that she had not expected. From the first week she had been received and invited with the crowd of girls in her class, and it was their custom in passing through the business part of the city to stop at the confectioners and take turns in treating to expensive candies, ice cream sodas, hot chocolate, or whatever they fancied. When first Elnora was asked, she accepted without understanding. The second time she went because she seldom had tasted these things, and they were so delicious she could not resist. After that she went because she knew all about it and had decided to go. She had spent a half hour on the log by the trail in deep thought and had arrived at her conclusions. She worked harder than usual for the next week, but she seemed to thrive on work. It was October, and the red leaves were falling when her first time came to treat. As the crowd flocked down the broad walk that night, Elnora called, "'Girls, it's my treat tonight. Come on!' She led the way through the city to the grocery they patronized when they had a small spread, and entering came out with a basket, which she carried to the bridge on her home road. There she arranged the girls in two rows on the cement abutments, and opening her basket, she gravely offered each girl an exquisite little basket of bark, lined with red leaves, in one end of which nestled a juicy big red apple, and in the other a spicy doughnut not an hour from Margaret Sinton's frying basket. Another time she offered big balls of popped corn stuck together with maple sugar, and liberally sprinkled with beechnut kernels. Again it was hickory nut kernels glazed with sugar, another time maple candy, and once a basket of warm pumpkin pies. She never made any apology or offered any excuse. She simply gave what she could afford, and the change was as welcome to those city girls, accustomed to sodas and French candy, as were these same things to Elnora surfeited on popcorn and pie. In her room was a little slip containing a record of the number of weeks in the school year, the times it would be her turn to treat, and the dates on which such occasions would fall, with the number of suggestions by each. 
Once the girls almost fought over a basket lined with yellow leaves and filled with fat, very ripe red haws. In late October there was a riot over one which was lined with red leaves and contained big fragrant pawpaws frostbitten to a perfect degree. Thin hazelnuts were ripe, and once they served. One day, Elnora, at her wit's end, explained to her mother that the girls had given her things and she wanted to treat them. Mrs. Comstock, with characteristic stubbornness, had said she would leave a basket at the grocery for her, but firmly declined to say what would be in it. All day, Elnora struggled to keep her mind on her books. For hours she wavered in tense uncertainty. What would her mother do? Should she take the girls to the confectioners that night, or risk the basket? Mrs. Comstock could make delicious things to eat, but would she? As they left the building, Elnora made a final rapid mental calculation. She could not see her way clear to a decent treat for ten people for less than two dollars, and if the basket was nice, then the money would be wasted. She decided to risk it. As they went to the bridge, the girls were betting on what the treat would be, and crowding near Elnora like spoiled small children. Elnora set down the basket. Girls, she said, I don't know what this is myself, so all of us are going to be surprised. Here goes. She lifted the cover, and perfumes from the land of spices rolled up. In one end of the basket lay ten enormous sugar cakes, the tops of which had been liberally dotted with circles cut from stick candy. The candy had melted in baking and made small transparent wells of waxy sweetness, and in the center of each cake was a fat turtle made from a raisin with clothes for head and feet. The remainder of the basket was filled with big spiced pears that could be held by their stems while they were eaten. The girl shrieked and attacked the cookies, and of all the treats Elnora offered, perhaps none was quite so long remembered as that. When Elnora took her basket, placed her books in it, and started home, all the girls went with her as far as the fence where she crossed the field to the swamp. When they parted, they kissed her goodbye. Elnora was a happy girl as she hurried home to thank her mother. She was happy over her books that night, and happy all the way to school the next morning. When the music swelled from the orchestra, her heart almost broke with throbbing joy, for music always had affected her strangely, and since she had been comfortable enough in her surroundings to notice things, she had listened to every note to find what it was that literally hurt her heart, and at last she knew. It was the talking of the violins. They were human voices, and they spoke a language Elnora understood. It seemed to her that she must climb up on the stage, take the instruments from the fingers of the players, and make them speak what was in her heart. She fairly prayed to get hold of one, if only for a second. That night she said to her mother, I am perfectly crazy for a violin. I am sure I could play one, sure as I live. Did anyone... Elnora never completed that sentence. Hush! thundered Mrs. Comstock. Be quiet. Never mention those things before me again. Never as long as you live. I loathe them. They are a snare of the very devil himself. They were made to lure men and women from their homes and their honor. If ever I see you with one in your fingers, I will smash it in pieces. Naturally, Elnora hushed, but she thought of nothing else after she had done justice to her lessons. At last there came a day when, for some reason, the leader of the orchestra left his violin on the grand piano. That morning, Elnora made her first mistake in algebra. At noon, as soon as the great building was empty, she slipped into the auditorium, found the side door which led to the stage, and going through the musician's entrance, she took the violin. She carried it back into the little side room where the orchestra assembled, closed all the doors, opened the case, and lifted out the instrument. She laid it on her breast, dropped her chin on it, and drew the bow softly across the strings. One after another, she tested the open notes. They reminded her of things. Gradually, her stroke ceased to tremble, and she drew the bow firmly. Then her fingers began to fall in softly. Slowly, she searched up and down those strings for sounds she knew. Standing in the middle of the floor, she tried over and over. It seemed scarcely a minute before the hall was filled with the sound of hurrying feet, and she was forced to put away the violin and go to her classes. A food she never thought until she noticed how heavy her lunchbox was on the way home, so she sat on the log by the swamp and remedied that. The next day she prayed that the violin would be left again, but her petition was not answered. That night when she returned from the school, she made an excuse to go down to see Billy. He was engaged in holding walnuts by driving them through holes in a board. His hands were protected by a pair of Margaret's old gloves, but he had speckled his face generously. He looked well and greeted Elnor hilariously. 
Me and the squirrels are laying up our winter stores, he shouted, cause the cold is coming, and the snow, and if we have any nuts we have to fix them now. But I'm ahead, cause Uncle Wesley made me this board, and I can hold a big pile while the old squirrel does only ist one with his teeth. Elnora picked him up and kissed him. Billy, are you happy? she asked. Yes, and so snap, answered Billy. You ought to see him make the dirt fly when he gets after a chipmunk. I bet you he could dig up paw if anybody wanted him to. Billy! gasped Margaret as she came out to them. Well, me and Snap don't want him up. I bet you Jimmy and Belle don't either. I ain't been twisty inside once since I've been here, and I don't want to go away, and Snap don't either. He told me so. Billy! That is not true. Dogs can't talk, cautioned Margaret. Then what makes you open the door when he asks you to? demanded Billy. Scratching and whining isn't talking. Anyway, it's the best Snap can talk, and you get up and do things he wants done. Chipmunks can holler, too. You ought to hear them damn things holler when Snap gets them. Billy, when you want a cookie for supper and I don't give it to you, it is because you said a wrong word. Well, for... Billy clapped his hand over his mouth and stained his face in swipes. Well, for anything... Did I go and forget again? The cookies will get all hard, won't they? I bet you ten dollars I don't say that any more. He espied Wesley and ran to show him a walnut too big to go through the holes, and Elnora and Margaret went into the house. They talked of many things for a time, and then Elnora said suddenly, Aunt Margaret, I like music. I've noticed that in you all your life, answered Margaret. If dogs can't talk, I can make a violin talk, announced Elnora and then in amazement watched the face of Margaret Sinton grow pale. A violin, she wavered. Where did you get a violin? They fairly seemed to speak to me in the orchestra. One day the conductor left his in the auditorium, and I took it, and, Aunt Margaret, I can make it do the wind in the swamp, the birds and the animals. I can make any sound I ever heard on it. If I had a chance to practice a little, I could make it do the orchestra music, too. I don't know how I know, but I do. Did... Did you ever mention it to your mother? faltered Margaret. Yes, and she seems prejudiced against them. But, oh, Aunt Margaret, I never felt so about anything, not even going to school. I just feel as if I'd die if I didn't have one. I could keep it at school and practice at noon a whole hour. Soon they'd ask me to play in the orchestra. I could keep it in the case and practice in the woods in summer. You'd let me play here over Sunday. Oh, Aunt Margaret, what does one cost? Would it be wicked for me to take of my money and buy a very cheap one? I could play on the least expensive one made. Oh, no, you couldn't. A cheap machine makes cheap music. You got to have a fine fiddle to make it sing. But there's no sense in your buying one. There isn't a decent reason on earth why you shouldn't have your fa- My father's, cried Elnora. She caught Margaret Sinton by the arm. My father had a violin. He played it. That's why I can. Where is it? Is it in our house? Is it in mother's room? Elnora, panted Margaret. Your mother will kill me. She always hated it. Mother dearly loves music, said Elnora. Not when it took the man she loved away from her to make it. Where is my father's violin? Elnora. I've never seen a picture of my father. I've never heard his name mentioned. I've never had a scrap that belonged to him. Was he my father, or am I a charity child like Billy, and so she hates me? She's got good pictures of him. Seems she just can't bear to hear him talked about. Of course he was your father. They lived right there when you were born. She don't dislike you. She just tries to make herself think she does. There's no sense in the world in you not having his violin. I've a great notion. Has she got it? No, I've never heard her mention it. It was not at home when he... when he died. Do you know where it is? Yes, I'm the only person on earth who does except the one who has it. Who is that? I can't tell you, but I will see if they have it yet and get it if I can. But if your mother finds it out, she will never forgive me. I can't help it, said Elnora. I want that violin. I want it now. I'll go tomorrow and get it if it has not been destroyed. Destroyed? Oh, Aunt Margaret, would anyone dare? I hardly think so. It was a good instrument. He played it like a master. Tell me, breathed Elnora. His hair was red and curled more than yours, and his eyes were blue. He was tall, slim, and the very imp of mischief. He joked and teased all day until he picked up that violin. Then his head bent over it, and his eyes got big and earnest. He seemed to listen as if he first heard the notes and then copied them. Sometimes he drew the bow trembly, 
like he wasn't sure it was right, and he might have to try again. He could almost drive you crazy when he wanted to, and no man that ever lived could make you dance as he could. He made it all up as he went. He seemed to listen for his dancing music, too. It appeared to come to him. He began to play, and you had to keep time or die. You couldn't be still. He loved to sweep a crowd around with that bow of his. I think it was the thing you call inspiration. I can see him now, his handsome head bent, his cheeks red, his eyes snapping and that bow going across the strings and driving us like sheep. He always kept his body swinging, and he loved to play. He often slighted his work shamefully and sometimes her a little. That is why she hated it. Oh, Nora, what are you making me do? The tears were rolling down Elnora's cheeks. Oh, Aunt Margaret, she sobbed. Why haven't you told me about him sooner? I feel as if you had given my father to me living, so that I could touch him. I can see him, too. Why didn't you ever tell me before? Go on, go on. I can't tell Nora. I'm scared to death. I never meant to say anything. If I hadn't promised her not to talk of him to you, she wouldn't have let you come here. She made me swear it. But why? Why? Was he ashamed? Was he disgraced? Maybe it was that unjust feeling that took possession of her when she couldn't help him from the swamp. She had to blame someone or go crazy, so she took it out on you. At times those first ten years, if I had talked to you and you had repeated anything to her, she might have struck you too hard. She was not master of herself. You must be patient with her, Elnora. God only knows what she has gone through, but I think she is a little better lately. So do I, said Elnora. She seems more interested in my clothes, and she fixes me such delicious lunches that the girls bring fine candies and cake and beg to trade. I gave half my lunch for a box of candy one day, brought it home to her, and told her. Since she has wanted me to carry a market basket and treat the crowd every day, she was so pleased. Life has been too monotonous for her. I think she enjoys even the little change made by my going and coming. She sits up half the night to read the library books I bring, but she is so stubborn she won't even admit that she touches them. Tell me more about my father. Wait until I see if I can get the violin. So Elnora went home in suspense, and that night she added to her prayers, Dear Lord, be merciful to my father, and oh, do help Aunt Margaret to get his violin. Wesley and Billy came into supper tired and hungry. Billy ate heartily, but his eyes often rested on a plate of tempting cookies, and when Wesley offered them to the boy, he reached for one. Margaret was compelled to explain that cookies were forbidden that night. What? said Wesley. Wrong word's been coming again. Oh, Billy, I do wish you could remember. I can't sit and eat cookies before a little boy who has none. I'll have to put mine back, too. Billy's face was a puzzle. It twisted in despair. Ah, go on, he said gruffly but his chin was jumping, for Wesley was his idol. "'Can't do it,' said Wesley. "'It would choke me.' Billy turned to Margaret. "'You make him,' he appealed. "'He can't, Billy,' said Margaret. "'I know how he feels. "'You see, I can't myself.' Then Billy slid from his chair, ran to the couch, buried his face in the pillow, and cried heartbrokenly. Wesley hurried to the barn and Margaret to the kitchen. When the dishes were almost washed, Billy slipped from the back door. Wesley, piling hay into the mangers, heard a sound behind him and inquired, "'That you, Billy?' "'Yes,' answered Billy. "'And it's all so dark you can't see me now, isn't it?' "'Well, mighty near,' answered Wesley. "'Then you stoop down and open your mouth.' Sinton had shared bites of apples and nuts for weeks, for Billy had not learned how to eat anything without dividing with Jimmy and Bell. Since he was separated from them, he shared with Wesley and Margaret. So he bent over the small figure and received an installment of cookie that almost choked him. "'Now you can eat it!' shouted Billy in delight. "'It's all dark. I can't see what you're doing at all.' Wesley picked up the small figure and set the boy on the back of a horse to bring his face level so that they could talk as men. He never towered from his height above Billy, but always lifted the little soul when important matters were to be discussed. "'Now what a dandy scheme!' he commented. "'Did you and Aunt Margaret fix it up?' No, she ain't had hers yet, but I got one for her. It's as soon as you eat yours, I'm going to take hers and feed her first time I find her in the dark. But, Billy, where did you get the cookies? You know Aunt Margaret said you were not to have any. I just took them, said Billy. I didn't take them for me. I just took them for you and her. Wesley swallowed hard and thought fast. In the warm darkness of the barn, the horses crunched their corn. A rat gnawed at a corner of the granary and among the rafters the white pigeon cooed a soft sleepy note to his dusky mate. 
Did did I steal?" wavered Billy through the darkness. Wesley's big hands closed until he almost hurt the boy. "No," he said vehemently. "That is too big a word. You just made a mistake. You were trying to be a fine little man, but you went at it the wrong way. You only made a mistake. All of us do that, Billy. The world grows that way. When we make mistakes, we can see them. That teaches us to be more careful the next time, and so we learn. How wouldn't it be a mistake? If you had told Aunt Margaret what you wanted to do, and asked her for the cookies, she would have given them to you. But I was afraid she wouldn't, and you just had to have it. Not if it was wrong for me to have it, Billy. I don't want it that much. Must I take it back? You think hard and decide yourself, suggested Wesley. Lift me down, said Billy after silence. I got to put this in the jar and tell her. Wesley set the boy on the floor, but as he did so, he paused one second and strained him close to his breast. Margaret sat in her chair sewing. Billy slipped in and crept up beside her. The little face was lined with tragedy. "'Why, Billy, whatever is the matter?' she cried as she dropped her sewing and held out her arms. Billy stood back. He gripped his little fist tight and squared his shoulders. "'I got to be shut up in the closet,' he said. "'Oh, Billy, what an unlucky day! What have you done now?' I stole, gulped Billy. He said it was just a mistake, but it was worser than that. I took something you told me I wasn't to have. Stole? Margaret was in despair. What, Billy? Cookies, answered Billy in equal trouble. Billy, wailed Margaret. How could you? It was for him and you, sobbed Billy. He said he couldn't eat it for me, but out in the barn it's all dark and I couldn't see. I thought maybe he could there. Then we might put out the light and you could have yours. He said I only made it worse, because I mustn't take things, and I know I mustn't, so I got to go in the closet. Margaret gazed at him helplessly. Will you hold me tight a little bit first? He did. Margaret opened her arms, and Billy rushed in and clung to her a few seconds with all the force of his being. Then he slipped to the floor and marched to the closet. Margaret opened the door. Billy gave one glance at the light, clenched his fist, and, walking inside, climbed on the box. Margaret shut her eyes and closed the door. Then she sat and listened. Was the air pure enough? Possibly he might smother. She had read something once. Was it very dark? What if there should be a mouse in the closet and it should run across his foot and frighten him into spasms? Somewhere she had heard. Margaret leaned forward with tense face and listened. Something dreadful might happen. She could bear it no longer. She arose hurriedly and opened the door. Billy was drawn up on the box in a little heap, and he lifted a disapproving face to her. "'Shut that door,' he said. "'I ain't been in here near long enough yet.'" End of chapter 9wherein Elnora has more financial troubles, and Mrs. Comstock again hears the song of the Limberlost. The next night, Elnora hurried to Sinton's. She threw open the back door and searched Margaret's face with anxious eyes. "'You got it!' panted Elnora. "'You got it! I can see by your face that you did. Oh, give it to me!' "'Yes, I got it, honey. I got it all right, but don't be so fast. You can't have it before Saturday. It has been kept in such a damp place it needed gluing.' It had to have strings, and the key was gone. I knew how much you wanted it, so I sent Wesley right to town with it. They said they could fix it good as new, but it should be varnished, and that it would take several days for the glue to set. You can have it Saturday. You found it where you thought it was? You know it's his? Yes, it was just where I thought, and it's the same violin I've seen him play hundreds of times. It's all right, only laying so long it needs fixing. Oh, Aunt Margaret, can I ever wait? It does seem a long time, but how could I help it? You couldn't do anything with it as it was. You see, it had been hidden away in the garret, and it needed cleaning and drying to make it fit to play again. You can have it Saturday, sure. Saturday morning? He just said Saturday. But, Elnor, you've got to promise me that you will leave it here, or in town, and not let your mother get a hint of it. I don't know what she'd do. Uncle Wesley can bring it here until Monday. Then I will take it to school so that I can practice at noon. Oh, I don't know how to thank you, and there's more than the violin for which to be thankful. You've given me my father. Last night I saw him plain as life. Elnora, you were dreaming. You couldn't have seen him. I know I was dreaming, but I saw him. 
I saw him so closely that a tiny white scar at the corner of his eyebrow showed. I was just reaching out to touch him when he disappeared. Who told you there was a scar on his forehead? No one ever did in all my life. I saw it last night just as he went down. And oh, Aunt Margaret, I saw what she did, and I heard his cries. No matter what she does, I don't believe I ever can be angry with her again. Her heart is broken, and she can't help it. Oh, it was terrible, but I'm glad I saw it. Now I will always understand. I don't know what to make of that, said Margaret. I don't believe in such stuff at all, but you couldn't make it up, for you didn't know. I only know that I played the violin last night as he played it, and while I played he came through the woods from the direction of Carney's. It was summer, and all the flowers were in bloom. He wore gray trousers and a blue shirt. His head was bare, and his face was beautiful. I could almost touch him when he sank. Margaret Sinton stood perplexed. "'Well, I don't know what to think of that,' she ejaculated. "'I was next to the last person who saw him before he was drowned. "'It was late on a June afternoon, and he was dressed as you described. "'He was bareheaded because he had found a quail's nest before the bird began to brood, "'and he gathered the eggs in his hat and left it in a fence corner to get on his way home. "'They found it afterward. "'Was he coming from Carney's? "'He was on that side of the quagmire. "'Why he ever skirted it so close as to get caught is a mystery you will have to dream out.' I never could understand it. Was he doing something he didn't want my mother to know? Why? Because if he was, he might have cut close to the swamp so he couldn't be seen from the garden. You know, the whole path straight to the pool where he sank can be seen from our back door. It's firm on our side. The danger is on the north and east. If he didn't want mother to know, he might have tried to pass on either of those sides and gone too close. Was he in a hurry? Yes, he was, said Margaret. He had been away longer than he expected, and he almost ran when he started home. And he left his violin somewhere that you knew, and you went and got it. I'll wager he was going to play and didn't want Mother to find it out. It wouldn't make any difference to you if you knew every little thing, so quit thinking about it and just be glad you are to have what he loved best of anything. That's true, and I must hurry home, or I'll have to be cutting too close to swamp myself. I'm dreadfully late. Elnora sprang up and ran down the road, but when she was near the cabin, she climbed the fence, crossed the open woods pasture diagonally, and entered at the back garden gate. As she often came that way when she had been looking for cocoons, her mother asked no questions. Elnora lived by the minute until Saturday, when, contrary to his usual custom, Sinton went to town in the forenoon, taking her along to buy some groceries. Sinton drove straight to the music store and asked for the violin he had left to be mended. In its new coat of varnish with new keys and strings, it looked greatly like any other violin to Sinton, but to Elnora it was the most beautiful instrument ever made in a priceless treasure. She held it in her arms, touched the strings softly, and then she drew the bow across them in whispering measure. She had no time to think what a remarkably good bow it was for sixteen years' disuse. The tan leather case might have impressed her as being in fine condition also, had she been in a state to question anything. She did remember to ask for the bill, and she was gravely presented with a slip calling for four strings, one key, and a coat of varnish. Total, one dollar fifty. It seemed to Elnora she never could put the precious instrument in the case and start home. Wesley left her in the music store, where the proprietor showed her all he could about tuning, and gave her several beginner sheets of notes and scales. She carried the violin in her arms as far as the crossroads at the corner of their land, then reluctantly put it under the carriage seat. As soon as her work was done, she ran down the sentence and began to play, and on Monday the violin went to school with her. She made arrangements with the superintendent to leave it in his office, and scarcely took time for her food at noon. She was so eager to practice. Often one of the girls asked her to stay in town all night for some lecture or entertainment. She could take the violin with her, practice, and secure help. Her skill was so great that the leader of the orchestra offered to give her lessons if she would play to pay for them, so her progress was rapid in technical work. But from the first day the instrument became hers, with perfect faith that she could play as her father did, she spent half her practice time in imitating the sounds of all outdoors and improvising the songs her happy heart sang in those days. So the first year went, and the second and third were a repetition. But the fourth was different, for that was the close of the course, ending with graduation and all its attendant ceremonies and expenses. 
To Elnora these appeared mountain high. She had hoarded every cent, thinking twice before she parted with a penny, but teaching natural history in the grades had taken time from her studies in school, which must be made up outside. She was a conscientious student, ranking first in most of her classes and standing high in all branches. Her interest in her violin had grown with the years. She went to school early and practiced a half hour in the little room off the stage while the orchestra gathered. She put in a full hour at noon and remained another half hour at night. She carried the violin to Sentence on Saturday and practiced all the time she could there while Margaret watched the road to see that Mrs. Comstock was not coming. She had become so skillful that it was a delight to hear her play the music of any composer. But when she played her own, that was joy inexpressible. For then the wind blew, the water rippled, the Limberlost sang her songs of sunshine, shadow, black storm, and white night. Since her dream, Elnora had regarded her mother with peculiar tenderness. The girl realized, in a measure, what had happened. She avoided anything that possibly could stir bitter memories or draw deeper a line on the hard, white face. This cost many sacrifices, much work, and sometimes delayed progress, but the horror of that awful dream remained with Elnora. She worked her way cheerfully, doing all she could to interest her mother in things that happened in school, in the city, and by carrying books that were interesting from the public libraries. Three years had changed Elnora from the girl of sixteen to the very verge of womanhood. She had grown tall, round, and her face had the loveliness of perfect complexion, beautiful eyes and hair, and an added touch from within that might have been called comprehension. It was a compound of self-reliance, hard knocks, heart hunger, unceasing work and generosity there was no form of suffering with which the girl could not sympathize no work she was afraid to attempt no subject she had investigated she did not understand these things combined to produce a breadth and depth of character altogether unusual she was so absorbed in her classes and her music that she had not been able to gather specimens as usual when she realized this and hunted assiduously she soon found that changing natural conditions had affected such work men all around were clearing available land the trees fell wherever corn would grow the swamp was broken by several gravel roads dotted in places around the edge with little frame houses and the machinery of oil wells one especially low place around the region of freckles room was nearly all that remained of the original wherever the trees fell the moisture dried the creek ceased to flow the river ran low and at times the bed was dry with unbroken sweep the winds of the west came gathering force with every mile, and howled and raved, threatening to tear the shingles from the roof, blowing the surface from the soil in clouds of fine dust, and rapidly changing everything. From coming in with two or three dozen rare moths in a day, in three years' time, Elnora had grown to be delighted with finding two or three. Big Percy caterpillars could not be picked from their favorite bushes when there were no bushes. Dragonflies would not hover over dry places, and butterflies became scarce in proportion to the flowers, while no land yields over three crops of Indian relics. All the time the expense of books, clothing, and incidentals had continued. Elnora added to her bank account whenever she could, and drew out when she was compelled, but she omitted the important feature of calling for a balance. So one early spring morning, in the last quarter of the fourth year, she almost fainted when she learned that all her funds were gone commencement with its extra expense was coming she had no money and very few cocoons to open in june which would be too late she had one collection for the bird woman complete to a pair of imperialist moths and that was her only asset on the day she added these big yellow emperors she would get a check for three hundred dollars but she would not get it until these specimens were secured she remembered that she never had found an emperor before june moreover that sum was for her first year in college then she would be of age, and she meant to sell enough of her share of her father's land to finish. She knew her mother would oppose her bitterly in that, for Mrs. Comstock had clung to every acre and tree that belonged to her husband. Her land was almost complete forest, where her neighbors owned cleared farms, dotted with wells that every hour sucked oil from beneath her holdings, but she was too absorbed in the grief she nursed to know or care. The brushwood road and the redredging of the great Limberlost ditch had been more than she could pay from her income, and she had trembled before the wicket as she asked the banker if she had funds to pay it, and wondered why he laughed as he assured her she had. For Mrs. Comstock had spent no time on compounding interest, and never added the sum she had been depositing through nearly twenty years. 
Now she thought her funds were almost gone, and every day she worried over expenses. She could see no reason in going through the forms of graduation when pupils had all in their heads that was required to graduate. Elnora knew she had to have her diploma in order to enter the college she wanted to attend, but she did not dare utter the word until high school was finished, for, instead of softening as she hoped her mother had begun to do, she seemed to remain very much the same. When the girl reached the swamp, she sat on a log and thought bitterly over the absolute expense she was compelled to meet. Every member of her particular set was having an expensive photograph taken to exchange with the others. Elnora loved these girls and boys, and to say she could not have their pictures to keep was more than she could bear. Each one would give to all the others a handsome graduation present. She knew they would prepare gifts for her whether she could make a present in return or not. Then it was the custom for each graduating class to give a great entertainment and use the funds to present the school with a statue for the entrance hall. Elnora had been cast for and was practicing a part in that performance. She was expected to furnish her dress and personal necessities. She had been told that she must have a green dress, and where was it to come from? Every girl of the class would have three beautiful new frocks for commencement, one for the baccalaureate sermon, another, which could be plainer, for graduation exercises, and a handsome one for the banquet and ball. Elnora faced the past three years and wondered how she could have spent so much money and not kept account of it. She did not realize where it had gone. She did not know what she could do now. She thought over the photographs and at last settled that question to her satisfaction. She studied longer over the gifts, ten handsome ones there must be, and at last decided she could arrange for them. The green dress came first. The lights would be dim in the scene and the setting deep woods. She could manage that. She simply could not have three dresses. She would have to get a very simple one for the sermon and do the best she could for graduation. Whatever she got for that must be made with a gimp that could be taken out to make it a little more festive for the ball. But where could she get even two pretty dresses? The only hope she could see was to break into the collection of the man from India, sell some malls, and try to replace them in June. But in her soul she knew that never would do. No June ever brought just the thing she hoped it would. If she spent the college money, she knew she could not replace it. If she did not, the only way was to try for a room in the grades and teach a year. Her work there had been so appreciated that Elnora felt with the recommendation she knew she could get from the superintendent and teachers, she could secure a position. She was sure she could pass the examinations easily. She had once gone on Saturday, taken them, and secured a license for a year before she left the Brushwood School. She wanted to start to college when the other girls were going. If she could make the first year alone, she could manage the rest. But make that first year herself, she must. Instead of selling any of her collection, she must hunt as she never before had hunted and find a yellow emperor. She had to have it. That was all. Also, she had to have those dresses. She thought of Sinton and dismissed it. She thought of the bird woman and knew she could not tell her. She thought of every way in which she ever had hoped to earn money and realized that with the play, committee meetings, practicing, and final examinations, she scarcely had time to live, much less to do more than the work required for her pictures and gifts. Again, Elnora was in trouble, and this time it seemed the worst of all. It was dark when she arose and went home. Mother, she said, I have a piece of news that is decidedly not cheerful. Then keep it to yourself, said Mrs. Comstock. I think I have enough to bear without a great girl like you piling trouble on me. My money is all gone, said Elnora. Well, did you think it would last forever? It's been a marvel to me that it's held out as well as it has the way you've dressed and gone. I don't think I've spent any that I was not compelled to, said Elnora. I've dressed on just as little as I possibly could to keep going. I am heart sick. I thought I had over fifty dollars to put me through commencement, but they tell me it's all gone. Fifty dollars to put you through commencement? Well, what on earth are you proposing to do? The same as the rest of them, in the very cheapest way possible. And what might that be? Elnora omitted the photographs, the gifts, and the play. She told only of the sermon, graduation exercises, and the ball. Well, I won't trouble myself over that, sniffed Mrs. Comstock. If you want to go to a sermon, put on the dress you always use for meeting. If you need white for exercises, wear the new dress you got last spring. As for the ball, the best thing for you to do is to stay a mile away from such folly. In my opinion, you'd best bring home your books and quit right now. You can't be fixed like the rest of them. Don't be so foolish as to run into it. Just stay here and let these last few days go. You can't learn enough more to be of any account. 
"But, Mother!" gasped Eleanor. "You don't understand!" "Oh, yes, I do," said Mrs. Comstock. "I understand perfectly. So long as the money lasted, and you held up your head and went sailing without even explaining how you got it from the stuff you gathered, goodness knows I couldn't see; but now it's gone, you come whining to me. What have I got? Have you forgot that the ditch in the road completely strapped me? I haven't any money. There's nothing for you to do but get out of it." "I can't," said Eleanor desperately. "I've gone on too long. It would make a break in everything. They wouldn't let me have my diploma." "What's the difference? You've got the stuff in your head. I wouldn't give a rap for a scrap of paper. That don't mean anything." "But I've worked four years for it, and I can't enter. I ought to have it to help me get a school when I want to teach. If I don't have my grades to show, people will think I quit because I couldn't pass my examinations. I must have my diploma." "'Then get it,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'The only way is to graduate with the rest.' "'Well, graduate if you're bound to.' "'But I can't, unless I have things enough like the others, "'that I don't look as I did that first day.' "'Well, please remember, I didn't get you into this, "'and I can't get you out. "'You are set on having your own way. "'Go on and have it and see how you like it.' "'Elnora went upstairs and did not come down again that night, "'which her mother called pouting.' "'I've thought all night,' said the girl at breakfast, "'and I can't see any way but to borrow the money of Uncle Wesley "'and pay it back from some that the bird woman will owe me "'when I get one more specimen. "'But that means that I can't go to, "'that I will have to teach this winter "'if I can get a city grade or a country school.' "'Just you dare go dinging after Wesley sent him for money,' "'cried Mrs. Comstock. "'You won't do any such a thing.' "'I can't see any other way. "'I've got to have the money.' "'Quit, I tell you.' I can't quit. I've gone too far. Well, then, let me get your clothes and you can pay me back. But you said you had no money. Maybe I can borrow some at the bank. Then you can return it when the bird woman pays you. All right, said Elnora. I don't have to have expensive things. Just some kind of a pretty cheap white dress for the sermon, and the white one a little better than I had last summer for commencement in the ball. I can use the white gloves and shoes I got myself for last year, and you can get my dress made at the same place you did that one. They have my measurements and do perfect work. Don't get expensive things. It will be warm, so I can go bareheaded. Then she started to school, but was so tired and discouraged she scarcely could walk. Four years as plans going in one day. For she felt that if she did not get started to college that fall, she never would. Instead of feeling relieved at her mother's offer, she was almost too ill to go on. For the thousandth time, she groaned, Oh, why didn't I keep account of my money? After that, the days went so swiftly, she scarcely had time to think. But several trips her mother made to town, and the assurance that everything was all right, satisfied Elnora. She worked very hard to pass good final examinations and perfect herself for the play. For two days she had remained in town with the bird woman, in order to spend more time practicing and at her work. Often Margaret had asked about her dresses for graduation, and Elnora had replied that they were with a woman in the city who had made her a white dress for last year's commencement when she was a junior usher, and they would be all right. So Margaret, Wesley, and Billy concerned themselves over what they would get her for a present. Margaret suggested a beautiful dress. Sinton said that would look to everyone as if she needed dresses. The thing was to get a handsome gift like all the rest would have. Billy wanted to present her a five-dollar gold piece to buy music for a violin. He was positive Elnora would like that best of anything. It was toward the close of the term when they drove to town one evening to try to settle this important question. They knew Mrs. Comstock had been alone several days, so they asked her to accompany them. She had been more lonely than she would admit, filled with unusual unrest besides, and so she was glad to go. But before they had driven a mile, Billy had told that they were going to buy Elnora a graduation present, and Mrs. Comstock devoutly wished that she had remained at home. She was prepared when Billy asked, "'Aunt Kate, what are you going to give Elnora when she graduates?' "'Plenty to eat, a good bed to sleep in, and do all the work while she trollops,' answered Mrs. Comstock dryly. Billy reflected. "'I guess all of them have got that,' he said. "'I mean a present you buy at the store, like Christmas.' "'It is only rich folks that buy presents at stores,' replied Mrs. Comstock. "'I can't afford it.' "'Well, we ain't rich,' he said. "'But we are going to buy Elnora something as fine as the rest of them have "'if we sell a corner of the farm. Uncle Wesley said so.' "'A fool in his land is soon parted,' said Mrs. Comstock tersely. Wesley and Billy laughed, but Margaret did not enjoy the remark. 
While they were searching the stores for something on which all of them could decide, and Margaret was holding Billy to keep him from saying anything before Mrs. Comstock about the music on which he was determined, Mr. Brownlee met Wesley and stopped to shake hands. "'I see your boy came out finely,' he said. "'I don't allow any boy anywhere to be finer than Billy,' said Senton. "'I guess you don't allow any girl to surpass El Nora,' said Mr. Brownlee. "'She comes home with Ellen often, and my wife and I love her. Ellen says she is great in her part tonight. "'Best thing in the whole play. "'Of course you are in to see it. "'If you haven't reserved seats, "'you'd best start pretty soon for the high school auditorium. "'Only seats a thousand. "'It's always jammed at these home talent plays. "'All of us want to see how our children perform.' "'Why, yes, of course,' said the bewildered Senton. "'Then he hurried to Margaret. "'Say,' he said, "'there is going to be a play at the high school tonight, "'and Elnora is in it. "'Why hasn't she told us?' "'I don't know,' said Margaret, "'but I'm going.' "'So am I,' said Billy.' "'Me too,' said Wesley. "'Unless you think for some reason she don't want us. "'Looks like she would have told us if she had. "'I'm going to ask her mother.' "'Yes, that's what she's been staying in town for,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'It's some sort of a swindle to raise money for a class "'to buy some silly thing to stick up in the school household "'and remember them by. "'I don't know whether it's now or next week, "'but there's something of the kind to be done.' "'Well, it's tonight,' said Wesley, "'and we are going. "'It's my treat, and we've got to hurry, or we won't get in.' There's reserved seats, and we have none, so it's the gallery for us. But I don't care, so I get to take one good peep at Elnora. Suppose she plays, whispered Margaret in his ear. Aw, oh, tush, she couldn't, said Wesley. Well, she's been doing it three years in the orchestra and working like a slave at it. Oh, well, that's different. She's in the play tonight. Brownlee told me so. Come on, quick. We'll drive and hitch closest place we can find to the building. Margaret went in the excitement of the moment, but she was troubled. When they reached the building, Wesley tied the team to a railing, and Billy sprang out to help Margaret. Mrs. Comstock sat still. "'Come on, Kate,' said Wesley, reaching his hand. "'I'm not going anywhere,' said Mrs. Comstock, settling comfortably back against the cushions. All of them begged and pleaded, but it was no use. Not an inch would Mrs. Comstock budge. The night was warm and the carriage comfortable. The horses were securely hitched. She did not care to see what idiotic thing a pack of school children were doing. She would wait until the sentence returned. Wesley told her it might be two hours, and she said she did not care if it was four, so they left her. "'Did you ever see such cookies?' cried Billy. "'Such blame stubbornness in all your life,' demanded Sinton. "'Won't come to see as fine a girl as Elnora in a stage performance. Why, I wouldn't miss it for fifty dollars.' "'I think it's a blessing she didn't,' said Margaret placidly. "'I begged unusually hard so she wouldn't. I'm scared of my life for fear Elnora will play.' They found seats near the door where they could see fairly well. Billy stood at the back of the hall and had a good view. By and by, a great volume of sound welled from the orchestra, but Elnora was not playing. "'Told you so,' said Sinton. "'Got a notion to go out and see if Kate won't come now. She can take my seat, and I'll stand with Billy.' "'You sit still,' said Margaret emphatically. "'This is not over yet.' So Wesley remained in his seat. The play opened and went on very much like all high school plays have gone for the last fifty years. But Elnora did not appear in any of the scenes. Out in the warm summer night, a sour, grim woman nursed an aching heart and tried to justify herself. The effort irritated her intensely. She felt that she could not afford the things that were being done. The old fear of losing the land that she and Robert Comstock had purchased and begun to clear was strong upon her. She was thinking of him, how she needed him, when the orchestra music poured from the open windows near her. She leaned back, closed her eyes, and tried to make her mind a blank, to shut out even the music when the leading violin began a solo. Mrs. Comstock bore it as long as she could, and then slipped from the carriage and fled down the street. She did not know how far she went or how long she stayed, but everything was still, save an occasional raised voice when she wandered back. She stood looking at the building. Slowly she entered the wide gates and followed up the walk. Elnora had been coming here for almost four years. When Mrs. Comstock reached the door, she looked inside. The wide hall was lighted with electricity, and the statuary and the decorations of the walls did not seem like pieces of foolishness. The marble looked pure, white, and the big pictures most interesting. She walked the length of the hall and slowly read the titles of the statues and the names of the pupils who had donated them. She speculated on where the piece Elnora's class would buy could be placed to advantage. Then she wondered if they were having a large enough audience to buy marble, she liked it better than the bronze, but looked as if it cost more. How white the broad stairway was, 
Elle Nora had been climbing those stairs for years and never told her they were marble. Of course she thought they were wood. Probably the upper hall was even grander than this. She went over to the fountain, took a drink, climbed to the first landing, and looked about her, and then without thought to the second. There she came opposite the wide open doors and the entrance to the auditorium packed with people in a crowd standing outside. When they noticed the tall woman with white face and hair and black dress, one by one they stepped a little aside so that Mrs. Comstock could see the stage. It was covered with curtains and no one was doing anything. Just as she turned to go, a sound so faint that everyone leaned forward and listened, drifted down the auditorium. It was difficult to tell just what it was. After one instant, half the audience looked toward the windows, for it seemed only a breath of wind rustling freshly open leaves, just a hint of stirring air. Then the curtains were swept aside swiftly. The stage had been transformed into a lovely little corner of creation, where trees and flowers grew and moss carpeted the earth. A soft wind blew, and it was the gray of dawn. Suddenly a robin began to sing, then a song sparrow joined him, and then several orioles began talking at once. The light grew stronger, the dewdrops trembled, flower perfume began to creep out to the audience, the air moved the branches gently, and a rooster crowed. Then all the scene was shaken with a babble of bird notes in which you could hear a cardinal whistling and a blue finch piping. Back somewhere among the high branches a dove cooed and then a horse neighed shrilly. Then set a blackbird crying, To check! And the whole flock answered it. The crows began to caw and the lamb bleated. Then the grosbeaks, chats, and vurios had something to say. The sun rose higher, the light grew stronger, and the breeze rustled the treetops loudly. A cow bawled and the whole barnyard answered. The guineas were clucking, the turkey gobbler strutting, the hens calling, the chickens cheeping, the light streamed down straight overhead, and the bees began to hum. The air stirred strongly, and off in an unseen field a reaper clacked and rattled through ripening wheat while the driver whistled. An uneasy mare rickered to her colt. The colt answered, and the light began to decline. Miles away a rooster crowed for twilight, and dusk was coming down. Then a catbird and a brown thrush sang against a grosbeak and a hermit thrush. The air was tremulous with heavenly notes. The lights went out in the hall. Dusk swept across the stage. A cricket sang and a kitty did answer, and a wood peewee wrung the heart with its lonesome cry. Then a night hawk screamed, a whippoorwill complained, a belated killdeer swept the sky, and the night wind sang a louder song. A little screech owl tuned up in the distance, a barn owl replied, and the great horned owl drowned both their voices. The moon shone and the scene was warm with mellow light. The bird voices died and soft, exquisite melody began to swell and roll. In the center of the stage, piece by piece, the grasses, mosses, and leaves dropped from an embankment. The foliage softly blew away, while plainer and plainer came the outlines of a lovely girl figure, draped in soft, clinging green. In her shower of bright hair a few green leaves and white blossoms clung, and they fell over her robe down to her feet. Her white throat and arms were bare. She leaned forward a little and swayed with the melody, her eyes fast on the clouds above her, her lips parted, a pink tinge of exercise in her cheeks as she drew her bow. She played as only a peculiar chain of circumstances puts it in the power of a very few to play. All nature had grown still. The violin sobbed, sang, danced, and quavered on alone. No voice in particular, just the soul of the melody of all nature combined in one great outpouring. At the doorway, a white-faced woman bore as long as she could and then fell senseless. The men nearest carried her down the hall to the fountain, revived her, and then placed her in the carriage to which she directed them. The girl played on and never knew. When she finished, the uproar of applause sounded a block down the street, but the half-senseless woman scarcely realized what it meant. Then the girl came to the front of the stage, bowed and lifting the violin. She played her conception of an invitation to dance. Every living soul within sound of her notes strained their nerves to sit still and let only their hearts dance with her. When that began, the woman ran toward the country. She never stopped until the carriage overtook her halfway to her cabin. She only said she had grown tired of sitting and walked on her head. That night she asked Billy to remain with her and sleep on Elnora's bed. Then she pitched headlong upon her own and suffered agony of soul such as she never before had known. The swamp had sent back the soul of her love dead and put it into the body of the daughter she resented, and it was almost more than she could bear and live. End of chapter 10
Chapter Eleven of *The Girl of the Limberlost* by Jean Stratton Porter. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven, wherein Elnora graduates and Freckles and the Angel send gifts. That was Friday night. Elnora came home Saturday morning and went to work. Mrs. Comstock asked no questions, and the girl only told her that the audience had been large enough to more than pay for the piece of statuary the class had selected for the hall. Then she inquired about her dresses and was told they would be ready for her. She had been invited to go to the Bird Woman's to prepare for both the sermon and commencement exercises. Since there was so much practicing to do, it had been arranged that she should remain there from the night of the sermon until after she was graduated. If Mrs. Comstock decided to attend, she was to drive in with the sentence. When Elnora begged her to come, she said she thought not. She cared nothing about such silliness. It was almost time for Wesley to come to take Elnora to the city when, fresh from her bath with shining, crisply washed hair and dressed to her outer garment, she stood with expectant face before her mother and cried, Now my dress, mother! Mrs. Comstock was pale as she replied, It's on my bed. Help yourself. Elnora opened the door and stepped into her mother's room with never a misgiving. Since the night Margaret and Wesley had brought her clothing, when she first started the school, her mother had selected all of her dresses, with Mrs. Sinton's help made most of them, and Elnora had paid the bills. The white dress of the previous spring was her first maid at a dressmaker's. She had worn that as junior usher at commencement. But her mother had selected the goods, had it made, and it had fitted perfectly and had been suitable in every way. So, with her heart at rest on that point, Elnora hurried to the bed to find only her last summer's white dress, freshly washed and ironed. For an instant she stared at it, then she picked up the garment, looked at the bed beneath it, and then her gaze slowly swept the room. It was a very unfamiliar room. Perhaps this was the third time she had been in it since she was a very small child. Her eyes ranged over the beautiful walnut dresser, the tall bureau, the big chest inside which she never had seen, and the row of masculine attire hanging above it. Somewhere a dainty lawn or mole dress simply must be hanging, but it was not. Elnora dropped on the chest because she felt too weak to stand. In less than two hours she must be in the church at Onabasha. She could not wear a last year's wash dress. She had nothing else. She leaned against the wall and her father's overcoat brushed her face. She caught the folds and clung to it with all her might. Oh, father, father, she moaned. I need you. I don't believe you would have done this. She clung to the coat in dry-eyed agony and tried to think what she could do. At last, she opened the door. I can't find my dress, she said. Well, as it's the only one there, I shouldn't think it would be much trouble. You mean for me to wear an old wash dress tonight? It's a good dress. There isn't a hole in it. There's no reason on earth why you shouldn't wear it. Except that I will not, said Elnora. Didn't you get me any dress for commencement either? If you soil that tonight, I've plenty of time to wash it again. Sinton's voice called from the gate. In a minute, answered Elnora. She ran upstairs and in an incredibly short time came down wearing one of her gingham school dresses. With a cold, hard face, she passed her mother and went into the night. A half hour later, Margaret and Billy stopped for Mrs. Comstock with the carriage. She had determined fully that she would not go before they called. With the sound of their voices, a sort of horror of being left seized her, so she put on her hat, locked the door, and went out to them. How did Elnora look? inquired Margaret anxiously. Like she always does, answered Mrs. Comstock curtly. I do hope her dresses are as pretty as the rest, said Margaret. None of them will have prettier faces or nicer ways. They just don't have one half as pretty faces or one tenth as nice ways, boasted Billy, who was wrestling with fractions. Oh, you two make me tired, scoffed Mrs. Comstock. Wesley was waiting before the big church to take care of the team. As they stood watching the people enter the building, Mrs. Comstock felt herself growing ill without knowing why. When they went inside among the lights, saw the flower deck stage and the masses of finely dressed people, she grew no better. She could hear Margaret and Billy softly commenting on what was being done. That first chair in the very front row is Elnora's, exulted Billy, because she's got the highest grades and so she gets to lead the procession to the platform. The first chair? Lead the procession? Mrs. Comstock was dumbfounded. The notes of the pipe organ began to fill the building in a slow, rolling march. Would Elnora lead the procession in a gingham dress? 
or would she be absent in her chair vacant on this great occasion? For now Mrs. Comstock could see that it was a great occasion. Every one would remember how Elnora had played a few nights before, and they would miss her and pity her. Pity? Because she had no one to care for her. Because she was worse off than if she had no mother. For the first time in her life, Mrs. Comstock began to study herself as she would appear to others. Every time a junior girl came fluttering down the aisle, leading someone to a seat, and Mrs. Comstock saw a beautiful white dress pass, a wave of positive illness swept over her. What had she done? What would become of Elnora? As Elnora rode to the city, she answered Wesley's questions in monosyllables, so that he thought she was nervous or rehearsing her speech, and did not care to talk. Several times the girl tried to tell him, and realized that if she said the first word, it would bring a torrent of tears. The bird woman opened the screen and stared unbelievingly. "'Why, I thought you would be ready. You are so late,' she said. "'If you have waited to dress here, we will have to hurry.' "'I have nothing to put on,' said Elnora. In bewilderment, the bird woman drew her inside. "'Did, did,' she faltered. "'Did you think you would wear that?' "'No, I thought I would telephone Ellen that there had been an accident, and I could not come. "'I don't know yet how to explain. I'm too sick to think. "'Oh, do you suppose I can get something made by Tuesday so that I can graduate?' "'Yes, and you'll get something on you tonight so that you can lead your class as you have done for four years. "'Go to my room and take off that gingham quickly. "'Anna, drop everything and come help me.' "'The bird woman ran to the telephone and called Ellen Brownlee. Elnora has had an accident. She will be a little late, she said. You have got to make them wait. Have them play an extra musical number before the march. Then she turned to the maid. Tell Benson to have the carriage at the gate just as soon as he can get it there. Then come to my room. Bring the thread box from the sewing table, that roll of wide white ribbon on the cutting table, and gather all the white pins from every dresser in the house. But first, come with me a minute. I want that chunk with the swamp angel stuff in it from the cedar closet she panted as they reached the top of the stairs they hurried down the hall together and dragged the big trunk to the bird woman's room she opened it and began tossing out white stuff how lucky that she left these things she cried here are white shoes gloves stockings fans everything i am all ready but a dress said elnora the bird woman began opening closets and pulling out drawers and boxes i think i can make it this way she said she snatched up a creamy lace yoke with long sleeves that recently had been made for her and held it out. Elnora slipped into it, and the bird woman began smoothing out wrinkles and sewing in pins. It fitted very well with the little lapping in the back. Next, from among the angel's clothing, she caught up a white silk waist with low neck and elbow sleeves, and Elnora put it on. It was large enough, but distressingly short in the waist, for the angel had worn it at a party when she was sixteen. The bird woman loosened the sleeves and pushed them to a puff on the shoulders, catching them in places with pins. She began on the wide draping of the yoke, fastening it front, back, and at each shoulder. She pulled down the waist and pinned it. Next came a soft white silk dress skirt of her own. By pinning her waistband quite four inches above Elnora's, the bird woman could secure a perfect empire sweep with the clinging silk. Then she began with the wide white ribbon that was to trim a new frock for herself, bound it three times around the high waist effect she had managed, tied the ends in a knot, and let them fall to the floor in a beautiful sash. "'I want four white roses, each with two or three leaves,' she cried. Anna ran for them, while the bird woman added pins. Elnora, she said, "'forgive me, but tell me truly. Is your mother so extremely poor as to make this necessary?' "'No,' answered Elnora. Next year I am heir to my share of over three hundred acres of land covered with almost as valuable timber as was in the Limberlost. We adjoin it. There could be dozens of oil wells drilled that would yield to us the thousands our neighbors are draining from under us, and the bare land is worth over one hundred dollars an acre for farming. She is not poor. She is, I don't know what she is. A great trouble soured and warped her. It made her peculiar. She does not in the least understand, but it is because she don't care to, instead of ignorance. She does not— Elnora stopped. She is— is different, finished the girl. Anna came with the roses. The bird woman set one on the front of the draped yoke, one on each shoulder, and the last among the bright masses of brown hair. Then she turned the girl facing the tall mirror. Oh, panted Elnora, is that me? You are a genius. Why, I will look as well as any of them. "'Well, thank goodness for that,' cried the bird woman. "'If it wouldn't do, I should have been ill. 
You are lovely, altogether lovely. Ordinarily I shouldn't say that, but when I think of how you are carpentered, I'm adoring the result. The organ began rolling out the march as they came in sight. Elnora took her place at the head of the procession while everyone wondered. Secretly, they had hoped that she would be dressed well enough, that she would not appear poor and neglected. With this radiant young creature, gowned in the most recent style, her smooth skin flushed with excitement, and a rose-set coronet of red gold on her head, had to do with the girl they knew was difficult to decide. The signal was given, and Elnora began the slow march across the vestry and down the aisle. The music welled softly, and Margaret began to sob without knowing why. Mrs. Comstock gripped her hands together and shut her eyes. It seemed an eternity to the suffering woman before Margaret caught her arm and whispered, "'Oh, Kate, for any sake, look at her! Here, the aisle across!' Mrs. Comstock opened her eyes and, directing them where she was told, gazed intently and slid down in her seat on the verge of collapse. She was saved by Margaret's tense grip and her command, "'Here, idiot, stop that!' In the blaze of light, Elnora climbed the steps to the palm-embowered platform, crossed it, and took her place. Sixty young men and women, each of them dressed the best possible, followed her. There were manly, fine-looking men in that class which Elnora led. There were girls of beauty and grace, but not one of them was handsomer or clothed in better taste than she. Billy thought the time never would come when Elnora would see him, but at last she caught his eye. Then Margaret and Wesley got faint signs of recognition in turn, but there was no softening of the girl's face and no hint of a smile when she saw her mother. Heartsick, Katherine Comstock gripped her seat and tried to prove to herself that she was justified in what she had done, but she could not. She tried to blame Elnora for not saying that she was to lead a procession and sit on a platform in the sight of hundreds of people, but that was impossible, for she realized that she would have scoffed and not understood if she had been told. Her heart pained until she suffered acute agony with every breath. When at last the exercises were over, she climbed into the carriage and rode home without a word. She did not hear what Margaret and Billy were saying. She scarcely heard Senton, who drove behind, when he told her that Elnora would not be home until Wednesday. Early the next morning, Mrs. Comstock was on her way to Onabasha. She was waiting when the Brownlee store opened. She examined ready-made white dresses, but they had only one of the right size, and it was marked $40. Mrs. Comstock did not hesitate over the price, but whether the dress would be suitable. She would have to ask Elnora. She inquired her way to the home of the bird woman and knocked. "'Is Elnora Comstock here?' she asked the maid. "'Yes, but she is still in bed. I was told to let her sleep as long as she would.' "'Maybe I could sit here and wait,' said Mrs. Comstock. "'I want to see about getting her a dress for tomorrow. I am her mother.' "'Then you don't need wait or worry,' said the girl cheerfully. "'There are two women up in the sewing-room at work on a dress for her right now. "'It will be done in time, and it will be a beauty.' Mrs. Comstock turned and trudged back to the Limberlost. The bitterness in her soul became a physical actuality, and water would not wash the taste of wormwood from her lips. She was too late. She was not needed. Another woman was mothering her girl.' Another woman would prepare a beautiful dress such as Elnora had worn last night. The girl's love and gratitude would go to her. Mrs. Comstock tried the old process of blaming someone else, but she felt no better. She nursed her grief as closely as ever in the long days of the girl's absence. She brooded over Elnora's possession of the forbidden violin and her ability to play it until the performance could not have been told from her father's. She tried every refuge her mind could conjure to quiet her heart and remove the fear that the girl never would come home again, but it persisted. Mrs. Comstock could neither eat nor sleep. She wandered about the cabin and garden. She kept far from the pool where Robert Comstock had sunk from sight, for she felt that would entomb her also if Elnora did not come home Wednesday morning. The mother told herself that she would wait, but the waiting was bitter as anything she ever had known. When Elnora awoke Monday, another dress was in the hands of a seamstress and was soon fitted. It had belonged to the angel and was a soft white thing that with a little alteration would serve admirably for commencement in the ball. All that day Elnora worked, helping prepare the auditorium for the exercises, rehearsing the march and the speech she was to make in behalf of the class. The next day was even more busy. But her mind was at rest, for the dress was a soft, delicate lace, easy to change, and the marks of alteration impossible to detect. 
The Bird Woman had telephoned to Grand Rapids, explained the situation, and asked the angel if she might use it. The reply had been to give the girl all the things the chest contained. When the Bird Woman told El Nora, tears filled her eyes. "'I will write at once and thank her,' she said. "'With all her beautiful things, she does not need them, and I do. They will serve for me often and be much finer than anything I could afford. It is lovely of her to give me the dress and of you to have it altered for me, as I never could.' The Bird Woman laughed. "'I feel quite religious today,' she said. "'You know the first and greatest rock of my salvation is, "'Do unto others. "'I am only doing to you what there was no one to do to me "'when I was a girl very like you. "'Anna tells me your mother was here early this morning "'and that she came to see about getting you a dress.' "'She is too late,' said Elnora coldly. "'She had over a month to prepare my dresses, "'and I was to pay for them, so there is no excuse.' "'Nevertheless, she is your mother,' said the Bird Woman softly. "'I think almost any kind of a mother must be better than none at all, "'and you say she has had great trouble.' "'She loved my father, and he died,' said Elnora. "'The same thing, in quite as tragic a manner, "'has happened to thousands of other women, "'and they have gone on with calm faces "'and found happiness in life by loving others. "'There is something else I am afraid I never shall forget. "'This I know I shall not, but talking does not help.' I must deliver my presents and photographs to the crowd. I have a picture, and I made a present for you, too, if you would care for them. I shall love anything you give me, said the bird woman. I know you well enough to know that whatever you do will be beautiful. Elnora felt good over that, and as she tried on her dress for the last fitting, she was really happy. She looked lovely in the dainty gown. It would serve finely for the ball and many other like occasions, and it was her very own. The bird woman's driver took Elnora in the carriage, and she called on all the girls with whom she was especially intimate, and left her picture in the package containing her gift to them. By the time she returned, parcels for her were arriving. Friends seemed to spring from everywhere. Almost everyone she knew had some gift for her, while because they so loved her the members of her crowd had made her beautiful presents. There were books, vases, silver pieces, handkerchiefs, fans, boxes of flowers and candy. One big package settled the trouble at Sinton's, for it contained a dainty dress from Margaret, a five-dollar gold piece, conspicuously labeled, I earned this myself, from Billy, with which to buy music, and a gorgeous cut-glass perfume bottle would have cost five dollars to fill with even a moderate-priced scent, from Wesley. In an express crate was a fine curly maple dressing table sent by Freckles. The drawers were filled with wonderful toilet articles from the Angel, the bird woman added an embroidered linen cover and a small silver vase for a few flowers, and no girl of the class had finer gifts. Elnora laid her head on the table sobbing, happily, and the bird woman was almost crying herself. Professor Henley sent an elegantly printed and illustrated butterfly book. The grade rooms in which Elnora had taught gave her a set of volumes covering every phase of life afield in the woods and water. Elnora had no time to read, so she just carried one of these books around with her, hugging it as she went. After she had gone to dress, a queer-looking package was brought by a small boy who hopped on one foot as he handed it in and said, "'Tell Elnora that is from her ma.' "'Who are you?' asked the bird woman as she took the bundle. "'I'm Billy,' announced the boy. "'I gave her the five dollars. I earned it myself, dropping corn, sticking onions, and pulling weeds. My, but you gotta drop and stick and pull a lot before it's five dollars worth. Would you like to come in and see Elnora's gifts?' "'Yes, ma'am,' said Billy, trying to stand quietly. He followed into the room and gazed around. "'Gee, Mentley!' he gasped. "'Does Elnora get all this?' "'Yes.' I bet you a thousand dollars I'd be first in my class when I graduate. Say, have the others got a lot more than Elnora? I think not. Well, Uncle Wesley said to find out if I could, and if she didn't have as much as the rest, he'd buy till she did if it took a hundred dollars. Say, you ought to know him. He's just scrumptious. There ain't anybody anywhere finer than he is. My, he's grand. I'm quite sure of it, said the bird woman. I've often heard Elnora say so. Billy strutted around the table admiringly. "'I bet you nobody can beat this,' he boasted. Then he stopped, thinking deeply. "'I don't know, though,' he began reflectively. "'Some of them are awful rich. They got big families to give them things and wagon loads of friends, and I haven't seen what they got. Now maybe Elnora is getting left after all.' He lifted an anxious little freckled face to the bird woman. She cleared her throat. "'Don't worry, Billy,' she said. "'I will watch, and if I find Elnora is getting left, 
I'll buy her some more things myself. But I'm sure she is not. She has more beautiful gifts now than she will know what to do with, and others will come. Tell your Uncle Wesley his girl is bountifully remembered, very happy, and she sends her dearest love to all of you. Now you must go so I can help her dress. You will be there tonight to see her, of course. Yes, sirree, she got me a seat, third row from the front, middle section, so I can see, and she is going to wink at me after she gets her speech off her mind. She kissed me, too. She's a perfect lady, Elnora is. I'm going to marry her when I get big enough. Why isn't that splendid? laughed the bird woman as she hurried upstairs. Dear, she called, here's another gift for you. Elnora was half disrobed as she took the package and, sitting on a couch, opened it. The bird woman bent over her and tested the fabric with her fingers. Why, bless my soul, she cried, hand-woven, hand-embroidered linen, fine as silk. It's priceless. I haven't seen such things in years. My mother had garments like those when I was a child, but my sisters had them cut up for collars, belts, and fancy waists while I was small. Look at the exquisite work. Where could it have come from? cried Elnora. She shook out a petticoat with a hand-wrought ruffle a foot deep, then an old-fashioned chemise, the neck and sleeve work of which was elaborate and perfectly wrought. On the breast was pinned a note that she hastily opened. I was married in these, it read, and I had intended to be buried in them, but perhaps it would be more sensible for you to graduate and get married in them yourself if you would like. Your mother. From my mother? Wide-eyed, Elnora looked at the bird woman. I never in my life saw the like. Mother does things I think I never can forgive, and when I feel hardest, she turns around and does something that makes me think she just must love me a little bit, after all. Any of the girls would give almost anything to graduate in hand-embroidered linen like that. Money can't buy such things, and they came just when I was thinking she didn't care what became of me. Do you suppose she can be insane? Yes, said the bird woman, stark, staring mad, wildly insane if she does not love you and care what becomes of you. Elnora arose and held the petticoat to her. Will you look at it, she cried, only imagine her not getting my dress ready, and then turning around and sending me such a petticoat as this. Ellen would pay a hundred dollars for it and never blink. I suppose mother has had it all my life and I never saw it before. Go, take your bath and put on those things, said the bird woman. Forget everything and be happy. She is not insane. She is embittered. She did not understand how things would be. When she saw, she came at once to get your address. This is her way of saying she is sorry she did not get the other. You know this, she has not spent any money, so perhaps she is quite honest in saying she has none. Oh, she is honest, said Elnor. She wouldn't care enough to tell an untruth. She'd say just how things were no matter what happened. Soon Elnora was ready for her dress. She never had looked so well as when she again headed the procession across the flower and palm deck stage of the high school auditorium. As she sat there, she could have reached over and dropped a rose she carried into the seat she had occupied that September morning, four years previously, when she entered the high school. She spoke the few words she had to say in behalf of her class beautifully, had the tiny wink ready for Billy, and the smile and nod of recognition for Wesley and Margaret. When at last she looked into the eyes of a white-faced woman next to them, she slipped a hand to her side and raised her skirt the fraction of an inch, just enough to let the embroidered edge of a petticoat show a trifle. When she saw the look of relief which flooded her mother's face, Elnora knew that forgiveness was in her heart and that she would go home in the morning. It was late afternoon before she arrived and a dray followed with a load of packages. Mrs. Comstock was overwhelmed. She sat half dazed and made Elnora show her each costly and beautiful or simple and useful gift, tell her carefully what it was and from where it came. She studied the faces of Elnora's particular friends intently. The gifts from them had to be selected and set in a group. Several times she started to speak and then stopped. At last, between her dry lips, came a harsh whisper. Elnora, what did you give back for these things? I'll show you, said Elnora cheerfully. I got the same thing for the bird woman, Aunt Margaret, and you, if you care for it. But I have to run upstairs to get it. When she returned, she handed her mother an oblong frame, hand-carved, enclosing Elnora's picture, taken by a schoolmate's camera. She wore her storm coat and carried a dripping umbrella. From under it looked her bright face. Her books and lunchbox were on her arm, and across the bottom of the frame was carved, Your Country Classmate. Then she offered another frame. I am strong on frames, she said. They seem to be the best I could do without money. 
I located the maple and the black walnut myself in a little corner that had been overlooked between the river and the ditch. They didn't seem to belong to anyone, so I just took them. Uncle Wesley said it was all right, and he cut and hauled them for me. I gave the mill half of each tree for sawing and curing the remainder. Then I gave the woodcarver half of that for making my frames. A photographer gave me a lot of spoiled plates, and I boiled off the emulsion and took the specimens I framed for my stuff. The man said the white frames were worth three and a half and the black ones five. I exchanged those little frame pictures for the photographs of the others. For presents, I gave each one of my crowd one like this, only a different moth. The bird woman gave me the birch bark. She got it up north last summer. Elnora handed her mother a handsome black walnut frame a foot and a half wide by two long. It finished a small, shallow, glass-covered box of birch bark, to the bottom of which clung a big night moth with delicate pale green wings and long, exquisite trailers. A more beautiful thing would have been difficult to imagine. So you see, I do not have to be ashamed of my gifts, said Elnora. I made them myself and raised and mounted the moths. Moth, you call it, said Mrs. Comstock. I've seen a few of the things before. They are thick around us every June night, or at least they used to be, said Elnora. I've sold hundreds of them with butterflies, dragonflies, and other specimens. Now I must put away these and get to work, for it is almost June, and there are a few more I want dreadfully. When I get them, I will be paid some money for which I have worked a long time. She was afraid to say college just then. She thought it would be better to wait a few days and see if an opportunity would not come when it would work and more naturally. Besides, unless she could secure the yellow emperor she needed to complete her collection, she could not talk college until she was of age, for she would have no money. End of chapter 11